Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself, Boston, published at the Anti-Slavery Office, number 25, Corn Hill, 1845, entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1845 by Frederick Douglass in the Clerk's Office of the District Court of Massachusetts, narrated by Gregicator. Preface by William Lloyd Garrison. In the month of August, 1841, I attended an anti-slavery convention in Nantucket, at which it was my happiness to become acquainted with Frederick Douglass, the writer of the following narrative. He was a stranger to nearly every member of that body, but, having recently made his escape from the southern prison house of bondage, and feeling his curiosity excited to ascertain the principles and measures of the abolitionists, of whom he had heard a somewhat vague description while he was a slave, he was induced to give his attendance on the occasion alluded to, though at that time a resident in New Bedford. Fortunate, most fortunate occurrence, fortunate for the millions of his manacled brethren, yet panting for deliverance from their awful thraldom, fortunate for the cause of Negro emancipation and of universal liberty, fortunate for the land of his birth, which he has already done so much to save and bless, fortunate for a large circle of friends and acquaintances whose sympathy and affection he has strongly secured by the many sufferings he has endured, by his virtuous traits of character, by his ever-abiding remembrance of those who are in bonds, as being bound with them. Fortunate for the multitudes in various parts of our republic, whose minds he has enlightened on the subject of slavery, and who have been melted to tears by his pathos, or roused to virtuous indignation by his stirring eloquence against the enslavers of men, fortunate for himself, as it at once brought him into the field of public usefulness, quote, gave the world assurance of a man, end quote, quickened the slumbering energies of his soul and consecrated him to the great work of breaking the rod of the oppressor and letting the oppressed go free. I shall never forget his first speech at the convention, the extraordinary emotion it excited in my own mind, the powerful impression it created upon a crowded auditory completely taken by surprise, the applause which followed from the beginning to the end of his felicitous remarks. I think I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment, certainly my perception of the enormous outrage which is inflicted by it on the godlike nature of its victims was rendered far more clear than ever. There stood one, in physical proportion and stature commanding and exact, in intellect richly endowed, in natural eloquence a prodigy, in soul manifestly, quote, created but a little lower than the angels. Yet a slave... I, a fugitive slave, trembling for his safety, hardly daring to believe that on the American soil a single white person could be found who would befriend him at all hazards for the love of God and humanity, capable of high attainments as an intellectual and moral being, needing nothing but a comparatively small amount of cultivation to make him an ornament to society and a blessing to his race, by the law of the land, by the voice of the people, by the terms of the slave code, he was only a piece of property, a beast of burden, a chattel personal, nevertheless. A beloved friend from New Bedford prevailed on Mr. Douglas to address the convention. He came forward to the platform with a hesitancy and embarrassment, necessarily the attendance of a sensitive mind in such a novel position. After apologizing for his ignorance and reminding the audience that slavery was a poor school for the human intellect and heart, he proceeded to narrate some of the facts in his own history as a slave, and in the course of his speech gave utterance to many noble thoughts and thrilling reflections. As soon as he had taken his seat, filled with hope and admiration, I rose and declared that 
Patrick Henry, of revolutionary fame, never made a speech more eloquent in the cause of liberty than the one we had just listened to from the lips of that hunted fugitive. So I believed at that time. Such is my belief now. I reminded the audience of the peril which surrounded this self-emancipated young man at the North, even in Massachusetts, on the soil of the Pilgrim Fathers, among the descendants of revolutionary sires, and I appealed to them whether they would ever allow him to be carried back into slavery, law or no law, constitution or no constitution. The response was unanimous and in thunder tones. No. Will you succor and protect him as a brother man, a resident of the old Bay State? Yes, shouted the whole mass, with an energy so startling that the ruthless tyrants south of Mason and Dixon's line might almost have heard the mighty burst of feeling and recognized it as the pledge of an invincible determination on the part of those who gave it never to betray him that wanders, but to hide the outcast and firmly to abide the consequences. It was at once deeply impressed upon my mind that if Mr. Douglas could be persuaded to consecrate his time and talents to the promotion of the anti-slavery enterprise, a powerful impetus would be given to it, and a stunning blow at the same time inflicted on northern prejudice against a colored complexion. I therefore endeavored to instill hope and courage into his mind, in order that he might dare to engage in a vocation so anomalous and responsible for a person in his situation, and I was seconded in this effort by warm-hearted friends, especially by the late general agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, Mr. John A. Collins, whose judgment in this instance entirely coincided with my own. At first, he could give no encouragement. With unfeigned diffidence, he expressed his conviction that he was not adequate to the performance of so great a task. The path marked out was wholly an untrodden one. He was sincerely apprehensive that he should do more harm than good. After much deliberation, however, he consented to make a trial, and ever since that period he has acted as a lecturing agent under the auspices either of the American or the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. In labors, he has been most abundant, and his success in combating prejudice, in gaining proselytes, in agitating the public mind, has far surpassed the most sanguine expectations that were raised at the commencement of his brilliant career. He has borne himself with gentleness and meekness, yet with true manliness of character. As a public speaker, he excels in pathos, wit, comparison, imitation, strength of reasoning, and fluency of language. There is in him that union of head and heart, which is indispensable to an enlightenment of the heads and a winning of the hearts of others. May his strength continue to be equal to his day. May he continue to, quote, grow in grace and in the knowledge of God, end quote, that he may be increasingly serviceable in the cause of bleeding humanity, whether at home or abroad. It is certainly a very remarkable fact that one of the most efficient advocates of the slave population now before the public is a fugitive slave in the person of Frederick Douglass, and that the free-colored population of the United States are as ably represented by one of their own number in the person of Charles Lennox Ramond whose eloquent appeals have extorted the highest applause of multitudes on both sides of the Atlantic. Let the calumniators of the colored race despise themselves for their baseness and illiberality of spirit, and henceforth cease to talk of the natural inferiority of those who require nothing but time and opportunity to attain to the highest point of human excellence. It may perhaps be fairly questioned, whether any other portion of the population of the earth could have endured the privations, sufferings, and horrors of slavery without having become more degraded in the scale of humanity than the slaves of African descent. Nothing has been left undone to cripple their intellects, darken their minds, debase their moral nature, obliterate all traces of their relationship to mankind, and yet, 
How wonderfully they have sustained the mighty load of a most frightful bondage, under which they have been groaning for centuries. To illustrate the effect of slavery on the white man, to show that he has no powers of endurance in such a condition superior to those of his black brother, Daniel O'Connell, the distinguished advocate of universal emancipation and the mightiest champion of prostrate but not conquered Ireland, relates the following anecdote in a speech delivered by him in the Conciliation Hall, Dublin, before the Loyal National Repeal Association, March 31, 1845. No matter, said Mr. O'Connell, under what specious term it may disguise itself, slavery is still hideous. It has a natural and inevitable tendency to brutalize every noble faculty of man. An American sailor, who was cast away on the shore of Africa, where he was kept in slavery for three years, was, at the expiration of that period, found to be imbruted and stultified. He had lost all reasoning power, and having forgotten his native language, could only utter some savage gibberish between Arabic and English, which nobody could understand, and which even he himself found difficulty in pronouncing. So much for the humanizing influence of the domestic institution. End quote. Admitting this to have been an extraordinary case of mental deterioration, it proves at least that the white slave can sink as low in the scale of humanity as the black one. Mr. Douglas has very properly chosen to write his own narrative in his own style and according to the best of his ability, rather than to employ someone else. It is, therefore, entirely his own production, and, considering how long and dark was the career he had to run as a slave, how few have been his opportunities to improve his mind since he broke his iron fetters, it is, in my judgment, highly creditable to his head and heart. He who can peruse it without a tearful eye, a heaving breast, an afflicted spirit, without being filled with an unutterable abhorrence of slavery and all its abettors, and animated with a determination to seek the immediate overthrow of that execrable system, without trembling for the fate of this country in the hands of a righteous God who is ever on the side of the oppressed and whose arm is not shortened that it cannot save, must have a flinty heart and be qualified to act the part of a trafficker, quote, in slaves and the souls of men. I am confident that it is essentially true in all its statements that nothing has been set down in malice, nothing exaggerated, nothing drawn from the imagination, that it comes short of the reality rather than overstates a single fact in regard to slavery as it is. The experience of Frederick Douglass as a slave was not a peculiar one. His lot was not especially a hard one. His case may be regarded as a very fair specimen of the treatment of slaves in Maryland, in which state it is conceded that they are better fed and less cruelly treated than in Georgia, Alabama, or Louisiana. Many have suffered incomparably more, while very few on the plantations have suffered less than himself. Yet how deplorable was his situation! What terrible chastisements were inflicted upon his person! what still more shocking outrages were perpetrated upon his mind, with all his noble powers and sublime aspirations, how like a brute was he treated, even by those professing to have the same mind in them that was in Christ Jesus, to what dreadful liabilities was he continually subjected, how destitute of friendly counsel and aid, even in his greatest extremities, how heavy was the midnight of woe which shrouded in blackness the last ray of hope and filled the future with terror and gloom. What longings after freedom took possession of his breast and how his misery augmented in proportion as he grew reflective and intelligent, thus demonstrating that a happy slave is an extinct man. How he thought, reasoned, felt under the lash of the driver with the chains upon his limbs, what perils he encountered in his endeavors to escape from his horrible doom, and how signal have been his deliverance and preservation in the midst of a nation of pitiless enemies. This narrative contains many affecting incidents, 
many passages of great eloquence and power, but I think the most thrilling one of them all is the description Douglas gives of his feelings as he stood soliloquizing, respecting his fate and the chances of his one day being a free man on the banks of the Chesapeake Bay, viewing the receding vessels as they flew with their white wings before the breeze and apostrophizing them as animated by the living spirit of freedom. Who can read that passage and be insensible to its pathos and sublimity? Compressed into it is a whole Alexandrian library of thought, feeling, and sentiment, all that can, all that need be urged, in the form of expostulation, entreaty, rebuke, against that crime of crimes, making man the property of his fellow man. Oh, how accursed is that system which entombs the godlike mind of man, defaces the divine image, reduces those who by creation were crowned with glory and honor to a level with four-footed beasts, and exalts the dealer in human flesh above all that is called God. Why should its existence be prolonged one hour? Is it not evil, only evil, and that continually? What does its presence imply but the absence of all fear of God, all regard for man, on the part of the people of the United States? Heaven speed its eternal overthrow. So profoundly ignorant of the nature of slavery are many persons that they are stubbornly incredulous whenever they read or listen to any recital of the cruelties which are daily inflicted on its victims. They do not deny that the slaves are held as property, but that terrible fact seems to convey to their minds no idea of injustice, exposure to outrage, or savage barbarity. Tell them of cruel scourgings, of mutilations and brandings, of scenes of pollution and blood, of the banishment of all light and knowledge, and they affect to be greatly indignant at such enormous exaggerations, such wholesale misstatements, such abominable libels on the character of the southern planters, as if all these direful outrages were not the natural results of slavery, as if it were less cruel to reduce a human being to the condition of a thing than to give him a severe flagellation or to deprive him of necessary food and clothing, as if whips, chains, thumbscrews, paddles, bloodhounds, overseers, drivers, patrols were not all indispensable to keep the slaves down and to give protection to their ruthless oppressors, as if, when the marriage institution is abolished, concubinage, adultery, and incest must not necessarily abound, when all the rights of humanity are annihilated, any barrier remains to protect the victim from the fury of the spoiler. When absolute power is assumed over life and liberty, it will not be wielded with destructive sway. Skeptics of this character abound in society. In some few instances, their incredulity arises from a want of reflection, but generally it indicates a hatred of the light, a desire to shield slavery from the assaults of its foes, a contempt of the colored race, whether bond or free. Such will try to discredit the shocking tales of slaveholding cruelty which are recorded in this truthful narrative, but they will labor in vain. Mr. Douglas has frankly disclosed the place of his birth, the names of those who claimed ownership in his body and soul, and the names also of those who committed the crimes which he has alleged against them. His statements, therefore, may easily be disproved if they are untrue. In the course of his narrative, he relates two instances of murderous cruelty, in one of which a planter deliberately shot a slave belonging to a neighboring plantation who had unintentionally gotten within his lordly domain in quest of fish, and in the other, an overseer blew out the brains of a slave who had fled to a stream of water to escape a bloody scourging. Mr. Douglas states, that in neither of these instances was anything done by way of legal arrest or judicial investigation. The Baltimore American of March 17, 1845, relates a similar case of atrocity, perpetrated with similar impunity, as follows, quote, Shooting a slave, 
we learn upon the authority of a letter from Charles County, Maryland, received by a gentleman of this city, that a young man named Matthews, a nephew of General Matthews, and whose father, it is believed, holds an office at Washington, killed one of the slaves upon his father's farm by shooting him. The letter states that young Matthews had been left in charge of the farm, that he gave an order to the servant, which was disobeyed, when he proceeded to the house, obtained a gun, and, returning, shot the servant. He immediately, the letter continues, fled to his father's residence, where he still remains unmolested. End quote. Let it never be forgotten that no slaveholder or overseer can be convicted of any outrage perpetrated on the person of a slave, however diabolical it may be, on the testimony of colored witnesses, whether bond or free. By the slave code, they are adjudged to be as incompetent to testify against a white man as though they were indeed a part of the brute creation. Hence, there is no legal protection in fact whatever there may be in form, for the slave population, and any amount of cruelty may be inflicted on them with impunity. Is it possible for the human mind to conceive of a more horrible state of society? The effect of a religious profession on the conduct of southern masters is vividly described in the following narrative and shown to be anything but salutary. In the nature of the case, it must be in the highest degree pernicious, the testimony of Mr. Douglas on this point is sustained by a cloud of witnesses whose veracity is unimpeachable. Quote, a slaveholder's profession of Christianity is a palpable imposture. He is a felon of the highest grade. He is a man-stealer. It is of no importance what you put in the other scale. End quote. Reader, are you with the man-stealers in sympathy and purpose? or on the side of their downtrodden victims. If with the former, then you are the foe of God and man. If with the latter, what are you prepared to do and dare in their behalf? Be faithful, be vigilant, be untiring in your efforts to break every yoke and let the oppressed go free. Come what may, cost what it may, inscribe on the banner which you unfurl to the breeze as your religious and political motto, quote, no compromise with slavery, no union with slaveholders. William Lloyd Garrison, Boston, May 1, 1845.